my name is Rizal Zokapli. Welcome to the second edition of Leader Speak Easy with Rizal and Rosina. My co-anchor is, of course, Rosina Aziz, co-founder and CEO of Metamorphosa, a boutique consultancy which offers customized solutions for individuals, brands, and companies. Uh, Rosina has vast experience in corporate Malaysia, including media, and she's currently a global leadership coach. Before we continue, let's watch this webinar hygiene video. Welcome to Astro Awani Link's brand new webinar platform designed to enhance your experience, a couple of hygiene points. We recommend that you shut down other video and audio tabs to clear up your bandwidth for a better experience. Should you experience any technical difficulties such as lag or interruptions, please click on the red reconnect button. If there is a major glitch that is experienced by a majority of the people in the room, we may reset the entire system. Just sit back and relax. You will be taken to a new room automatically. If you have a question you would like to ask the speakers, kindly mark your remark as a question. And finally, we would appreciate it if you could tell us what you think of your webinar experience. Do give us a five-star rating if you like the session and write to us via the contact us form on our website. So, Rosie, as we face or as Malaysia faces challenges during this pandemic, leaders are in the uh, spotlight. Uh, we will talk to leaders of today and on how to build uh, current and future leaders. We want to reframe the conversation around leadership with the best interests of the nation always foremost in our minds. This is Leader Speak Easy with Rizal and Rosina. Good evening. Today we have with us Tan Sri Dr. Jamila Mahmood, who really does not need much of an introduction. So Tan Sri Dr. Jamila is a humanitarian who founded um, Mercy Malaysia, inspired by Medisa Son Frontier or Doctors Without Borders. As we know, her work has taken her to war and natural disasters. And she served in various uh, uh, roles for the UN, the UNFPA, the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. In March 2020, Tan Sri Dr. Jamila returned to Malaysia to assume the role of Special Advisor to the Prime Minister on Public Health. So we're looking forward to certainly having a relaxed, because our concept is a relaxed conversation with our special guest tonight. So I'd like to welcome Tan Sri to the second edition of Leaders Speak Easy with Rizal and me. Um, Tan Sri, welcome Sorry, to come. the show. Good evening. Salam. Good evening, Tan Sri. Yes. Um, ha, um, can you hear us? Um, how, how shall we address you tonight? We're really excited to have you, you here. You can call me anything you like, <laughs> but I normally Dr. Jim to friends. Okay. Um, so, Tashi, I hope you had a, a great week so far. Well, it's been uh, hectic, but uh, it's good. You know, I'm very thankful. I'm in good health and, uh, you know, I think that's uh, what matters. Alhamdulillah. So tonight, Rizal and I, we look forward to getting to know you better, of course, as an experienced leader and who can inspire a whole new generation of future leaders for the nation. So we will today touch on three areas. The first one is your leadership mantra, and then we'll move to leading in a pandemic, which is a very timely, timely um, topic to cover today. And then, then we go on to talking about what the future holds and we focus on leading the nation forward. And Tanshri, we will also be taking a few questions from the audience throughout the show to the audience. Thank you for joining us and do post your questions in the chat box. Rosie? So Tanshri, you have talked about your leadership mantra. We've been following you for a while. You talk about compassionate leadership, being strategic and of course adapting to changes, you know, like the, the environment you're in is always changing, yeah? as well as ensuring that the work you do is never about you. So I just have this question. Do you think that over time your leadership has evolved? And do you think that those guiding principles or your leadership mantra, as we call it, 
um, has changed at all, especially in recent years, you know, these strange times that we live in now. Yeah. I, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and uh, that's a, it's a really important question. You know, I think my background from childhood, you know, my career as a medical professional, obviously compassion and empathy are critical and therefore it becomes quite natural uh, for many of us who are in this profession to, I guess, uh, carry those leadership qualities. Have I changed over the last, you know, 20, 30 years? I'm sure I have. Uh, I think it also depends on context, right? How mm. you behave in your leadership role as well. Um, you know, when you're in an emergency, you can't afford to be, you know, trying to molly cuddle people, but you need to give instructions. And therefore, mm. you know, that kind of leadership is required. But always with compassion and empathy because you really bring the best out of people when you would do that. Um, I think that, you know, also depending on the role you're playing, when you are leading an organization that is very new, when I started Mercy Malaysia, I had yeah. to do a lot of salesmanship to try and get resources and so forth. So it was more of selling, you know, what you were doing uh, to get that support in the initial stage. And once it was established, it was much easier to then sort of calm down and then we would really, you know, talk about uh, things in a slightly different way. So COVID-19 has called for us to have much more compassion and empathy. In fact, if it is what we really, really needed right now, because it, as we manage a difficult situation like this, we have to always have you know, the empathy to put ourselves in people's shoes, where either when you're you know, giving, making policy decisions or, or concrete actions. Mm -hmm. And, and Tan Street, leaders are known for their celebrated successes, yet it's often said that great leaders learn from their past mistakes. Um, could you share with us your greatest success and perhaps also your biggest failure along the way? Let's start with the failure bit. I don't really choose one uh, one example. I have hundreds of where I have, you know, uh, I'm sure not done the best that I can. But mm -hmm. I think what I, I do is I try to learn from these mistakes so that mm -hmm. I don't repeat them again. And it's a wide ranging thing from, mm -hmm. you know, failure to recognize that sometimes, you know, your perceptions may be very different from others mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. I think in terms of success, um, <clears throat> the one I guess I'm proudest of must remain the founding of Mercy Malaysia because mm -hmm. it was a time where, you know, Malaysians uh, were unhappy a lot in, in 1998, mm -hmm. 99. And I really wanted to build an institution that would bring Malaysians together to do good. Um, I felt development was had to be measured beyond tall skyscrapers and highways mm -hmm. and that it was about you know our ability to have that global compassion and you know suffice to say i wasn't alone you know you can't be a leader without followers mm -hmm. and there were people who actually believe in the cause and mm -hmm. were ready to support uh, the mission and therefore you know the rest is history it has become you know a really a strong organization that I could easily hand over, you know, to continue the legacy of the organization. And I'm very proud of it. It warms my heart to hear Tan Sri uh, talked about the, uh, the the moment where she started Mercy and and moment, uh, you know, her, death, uh, her yeah. aversion to the word failure. Rosie? Yeah. So I just, you know, earlier, uh, we talk about followers, right? Mm. So, you know, I, I was just, having a chat earlier with somebody and then we talked about how we now live in the woke slash cancel culture and mm. a very hyper connected world so yeah. leaders i mean what you said earlier like you have like you know people have to learn to read the room and compassion is very important mm. right but the reality is with all this this um new culture out there on social media leaders have both followers like you said and they have critiques they have haters even you know we've yeah. seen a lot of leaders having to deal with this and it's in a crisis and and you know like sometimes bad news has got its own life you know yeah, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. so personally Tansri for for people who are new at leadership 
how do you deal with haters and you know so how would you advise them to deal with haters because you you know you, you i mean you know you have had a longer experience as a leader yes and lots of haters too <laughs> so everybody has I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mastered it now uh, so i think the first advice I would give is you have to have self-awareness. You have to know yourself well. What are your limits right, you can take, right? And we are all human. You know, you can be as strong as you say you are, but, you know, words hurt, actions hurt. So um, have the self-awareness. You, so one is either you engage or you disengage. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and, I, and in this world today with social media, right, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Whatever mm-hmm. you say, somebody will be unhappy. And you have to accept it. Uh, and if you're in a position of some, you know, authority or perceived to have some kind of authority, you will get a whole, whole range of reactions. And I think mm-hmm. that, you know, being able to have that self-awareness, being able to say, okay, this is where I do not react. This is when I can react. And, and sometimes, you know, take a digital detox. This is what I do. Towards the end of the year, I switch mm-hmm. off all my social yeah, media too. for a month or two, and mm-hmm. I feel so much better after that. It's, it's best to also recenter and relook at your purpose after that one year. That's like. right. Yeah. That's right. That's so right. when you I, do your digital detox, Tansi, do you get this FOMO thing, fear of missing out? No. 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 I, I, I should learn from you. I have no. digital FOMO. Um, no. When you were talking about, you know, not liking the word failure earlier mm. and looking at, you know, learning from, you know, everything that we do is a, is a learning opportunity, right? I was just wondering, you know, having led your life and done things that you know we can all you know admire from afar if you could start over your entire journey and it's been an illustrious one is there anything that you would do differently i'm sure there's so much i I would do differently the first thing i would do is i really wish you know i was uh, much more into exercise and stuff like fitness because i think you know it, it, it you need to be really fit to, to be able to persevere. And I think that's one area my parents didn't do very well in, in, in instituting, uh, yeah. you know, that to me. Um, but the other thing, I think what I think um, I would love to do better is really, you know, keep keep up on the digital technology side. Uh, you know, I think I'm pretty, you know, for 60 plus year old, I'm pretty savvy with, with digital stuff, I think for my age. But, um, I, you know, I think uh, the, my younger people around me will probably disagree. Uh, so I think, you know, the constant uh, curiosity to learn is something that I think um, I, I have, but I wish I had more of uh, because uh, it's it, the world is just changing so fast and you have to keep up. Okay. We have a question yeah. from Thor. Shall I read it to? Oh, you yes. want to read it? Okay, I'll, I'll read it to Tansri. Tansri, uh, we have a question from Sunny uh, Suwan Mithanot. Um, it's easy to let go of something that you've. Is, is it easy to let go of something that you've built and poured your heart and soul into, Tansri? You know, I thought it would would be really difficult, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, and, and let me tell you a story about yeah, this. Yeah, right? Tansri. <clears throat> You know, um, in 2005, I I said to the team, you know, I will leave in 2009. And they had this, we had this little retreat and they put, we put on the board life after gym. Because as I said, everyone calls me Dr. Jim, right? Mm -hmm. And we tried to imagine what would it be like without me there and Mm -hmm. that what then, what systems we need to put in place to be able to ensure a strong organization. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of support from the private sector and friends and all that to, you know, strengthen the organization. And then, you know, I decided June, June 2009, I would leave, right? And in mm-hmm. March, active education. And then in March, you know, I was, I was feeling, I, was, I remember sitting, standing in Geneva, very nervous about, you know, okay, I'm going to leave now. I hope everything will be okay. And you know it's going to be okay, but, you know, it's like yeah. your child, right? And you have mm-hmm. to give it up. And something amazing happened. I, I remember praying to God, and I think faith is what keeps me grounded and saying, give me some signs that is the right thing to do, right? Still needed to be convinced that it was going to be fine. 
And a group of women walked up to me, you know, right in front of the broken chair in Geneva and looked at me and they said, are you from Malaysia? And I said, yes. And I said, are you from Sudan? And we started this conversation. Mm. And then they said they were from Darfur. And I said, oh, I know Darfur because oh, okay. I work there. And they said, oh, they're from Janina. I said, oh, I've been to Janina. And then they asked me, do you know Mercy Malaysia? Oh, wow. And then I I was frozen, right? I just stood at them and I said, yes, I do know Mercy Malaysia. Why? And I thought she was going to complain. And then she said, well, you know, they built this, um, our, our maternity center, women's health center. And, uh, you know, women in Darfur don't have to die at childbirth anymore. And, and, and I remember being so stunned that, you know, something so unsolicited that you've done and people come and tell you that it's created impact. And then, and then she said, but do you know Dr. Jamila? Uh, and I said, I, I think so. Uh, and uh, I, I gave her my card, right? And, you know, they all got really excited and they were going to say that, you know, the women in Dafu will wait for you. And I just ran and, and cried all the way. And, oh. uh, and I said, gosh, you know, this is a really, it's time to leave, right? You leave when you, you know you've done something right and people give you unsolicited feedback. That's quite, that, that, that's quite a nice story. Thanks for sharing it. Um, but um, I think, you know, let's, let's mm. talk about leading in the pandemic. We can't the, avoid that, that That happened that in March of 2020, right, yes. Ashri? So after yes. that, there's the pandemic, right? Let, let, me, let, let me tell you the story how yeah, I yes. just came back. I didn't yes. come back to take this job. Uh, ah. I came back to escape COVID in Switzerland right? Because mm. they weren't testing. Mm. And, and I had a job in, in Geneva. I was the Under Secretary General of IFRC. And, uh, and then my husband and I said, you know, let's go home early because um, it looks like, you know, they're not testing and all that, you know, I'm high risk. Uh, and, you know, I had always intended to come home in 2020. Mm. Um, and it so happens that <clears throat> the year before, I met with Gansri Muradin Yassin when he wasn't the prime minister then. And we were talking about, you know, he said, when are you coming home? And I said, well, I promised my husband when I'm 60, I'll come home. So it would be 2020. But I thought it would be towards, you know, the end of 2020 mm. or something. And I had all sorts of plans, right, to take a year off, do yoga and all this stuff. And then... <laughs> And then I came, and then uh, when I knew I was coming back, you know, he got you know, to be that honest broker with him, right? To tell him mm. maybe things which are hard for other bureaucrats to tell him. But I try, I always tell him that, you know, that I'm going to be very honest with you. And I think, you know, he's a good listener. I mean, we have good, sometimes difficult conversations. But, um, but you know, I, I must say that, you know, I, I do enjoy talking to him. And at the end of the day, you know, as an advisor, you give advice. You know, he has advice from everywhere. He also gets advice from the ministries and the bureaucrats. And he has every right to listen to their advice. Yeah. But, so um, in, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so in the spirit of honesty, you talked about you know having to give um, tough um, and and advice uh, difficult the, yeah. advice, uncomfortable. <laughs> but anyway, so we just um, you know like since we you know started talking about uh, the second edition and you're making an appearance, we we're getting quite a lot of feedback from some people who who have contacted both Riza mm. and me. So that's you know so what seems to be the threat is like around the world. There are obviously many theories. I mean, we'll get to your your special advisory job later because you want to save the best for last, right? <laughs> so um, there are many theories and opinions about how the pandemic should be managed. So mm. I'm going to be like, you know, a bit naughty here, but it, it, it's something that a lot of people are, you know, giving feedback to us on. So a lot of them are saying it is better left the pandemic is better left managed left to the healthcare professionals the epidemiologists to manage and politicians should then take advice from the professionals mm -hmm. in order to manage the pandemic and here there are quarters who shared uh, this sentiment uh, following the aftermath of the uh, Sabah elections and we also talked about we we did an interview with you Tan Sri on your visit to Sabah uh, in November right so we saw yeah, that Riza. Yeah. but the thing is right there's also an ensuing debate which I mean I, I think you know I, mm. I would imagine that you'll be right in the middle of it when you're advising there's that that ensuing debate as well about how do you manage public 
safety and health in a pandemic and then at the moment at the same time you have the pressure of reopening the economy mm. so in your view in your honest view who do you think are the best people to lead in a pandemic i mean do you how well do you feel malaysia did in managing mm. it and how could we have done better because that it's it's a learning experience um you know uh, the, okay. the, how how okay. we've gone through the pandemic okay the first thing i would say is that there, there are pandemics and then mm. there's covid-19 mm-hmm. so as someone who's been involved in the management of pandemics before right mm. or, or ebola you know sars and 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 zika and so forth this is a very different uh virus it's very different and the extent of the impact is just so widespread and global so Uh, there are pandemics and then there there's covid-19 so mm-hmm. in the management of pandemics the basic you know requisite is a very strong team and a very strong health and science team and mm-hmm. i think we have that with the ministry of health you know the dg has been uh you know quite very solid in his approach and you know uh, he has been appearing on television and being you know giving the information that's required but at the same time you know you cannot go away from the fact that the country has to still be run in a pandemic and therefore you mm. do need that political leadership because unlike ebola or others that last a year and then goes off and may be confined to certain places this is mm. like affecting everyone so you're right it's affecting economy it's affecting mental health it's 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 disrupting social life you know it's really creating a all sorts of pressures from all sides so the management of pandemic must be founded on science it must be founded on evidence mm-hmm. in, a, in a, a pandemic of this this duration yes. mm-hmm. yeah so i think it is it must be a team approach now i will tell you very honestly that when i first arrived home we were meeting every morning at 8:00 uh, mm-hmm. everyone every minister the dg leads the discussions provides the data really robust discussions because the pandemic cannot be managed by the health ministry alone mm-hmm. it has to be you know enforcement has to be strong uh, policies it has to be good housing good social safety nets um you know it's it's got to do with education it has to do with livelihood so it's it's a multifaceted approach mm-hmm. which requires a multi stakeholder team that works on it but the requisite of successful pandemic management is building trust mm-hmm. and i think if it's one area we need to improve it's that mm-hmm. i think and you build trust when you actually you know can provide clear evidence all the time your communication your crisis communication is super clear uh, and that you know you make space to listen to everyone and i think you know let let's be very honest we are living in an environment now of a lot of mistrust right mm-hmm. when at every level so i think that you know it, it's it's been extra challenging for us mm-hmm. because of this environment i think it's also um i mean i mean i think now we're going more and more towards um, your role advising the government mm-hmm. i think trust is absolutely important and i think from what we've noticed as well communication to all levels and i think the connectivity of the different pillars managing it mm-hmm. so i think one of the things is in managing the pandemic there's so many stakeholders to consider you mentioned tan sri nor hisham abdullah's team mm-hmm. we have the medical frontliners we have the national security council yeah. we've got yeah. the commercial the CKS, sector the, yeah. the, the education yeah, yeah. people got you know education got disrupted Mm-hmm. and and politicians including lawmakers yeah and so tanshri how did your um, diverse family and professional background <laughs> prepare you for this challenging role so many uh, looking people at, right? looking at looking yeah. at different stakeholders yeah. Yeah. looking at the different interests what role uh, do you and and learning from the pandemic how do we build better health systems for the country and that's my main role so uh you know you have a very strong dg that's managing the pandemic i, I provide inputs based on my experience i provide inputs based on my international uh, exposure mm-hmm. but at the end of the day you know as advisor you advise but the one that i'm really focusing on right now is looking at you know really doing a deeper analysis of what have we seen now what covid-19 has 
basically been like a band-aid that's ripped off a wound, right? All the problems underlying you are now be, be surfacing. So, you know, where, are, where we have a good health system, you know, much better than most countries. But where is it that we could improve? What are the things we're seeing in terms of, um, you know, access to healthcare or so forth, right? We are mm-hmm. far better than most other countries. And I think that, you know, if you've been in situations where I have worked, you know, we I kiss the ground I, I walk on because I think we have such good health care in this country. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think, you know, my role now, you know, is working with the Ministry of Health, working with others to present to the Prime Minister kind of like a, if you like, a, a report uh, by me uh, to say, here's what we are learning uh, mm-hmm. about our health, uh, you know, where it can be improved, where it can be strengthened. And what's very clear is that health, does not belong only to the Ministry of Health. You cannot, mm. you know, have health transformation without economic investment, good planning, you know, bringing in all the different um, uh, aspects of health. Clinical, you know, medicalized health is only 20% of health. You know, mm-hmm. the rest is about environments, about social factors. You know, you have diabetes, you can build the best hospitals, but if you're not going to watch what you eat and you're not going to exercise, you're going to get, you know, sick. So it's about lifestyle changes. It's about all sorts of things uh, that also stems from education. Mm-hmm. How do you make sure people eat well and exercise and so on and so forth, right? Uh, that, uh, that's right. Uh, if I could, uh, Rosie, can I just ask one question? Yes, um, sure. Because I think you mentioned very difficult uh, issues that you're looking at because uh, that has been uh, have been brought forth because of the pandemic. Yes. You yes. are a very strong leader, Tansri. And I believe the Prime Minister is also a very strong leader. So how do two leaders talk to each other, two very strong leaders talk to each other on difficult issues like that? How do you resolve issues? How do you move forward and look look at these, these very difficult issues? I think, I think being an advisor is quite a privileged role because you have conversations. Mm. I, I don't necessarily have to tell the Prime Minister, you know, what, and he has, he's not obliged to listen to what I say. But I can say to him, you know, here's the evidence that is clear and here's what other people are doing. And here are the things that maybe you want to consider for the country. So, you know, I write papers to him. I send him policy drafts or all sorts of things so that he can, you know, be a keep abreast of what is, you know, I guess my opinion, but my opinion founded on evidence. They don't necessarily be mine. They might may not be giving him the best advice. And I think we've got to, yeah, we've got to be humble about that, right? I mean, like, mm-hmm. you're not miss know all that you have to. Everybody has to listen to you. And that's right. We can't, of course, discuss the uh, leadership. Uh, we can't discuss leadership in a pandemic without getting into the COVID nineteen national immunization program, Rosie. Absolutely, <laughs> we have to get into it. I know that's not your your you know the only thing that you're involved in terms of advisory work. Um, so. You know, we've got like some interesting uh, feedback. So, you know, the, 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 the politics versus prof- healthcare professionals managing it. And you talked about uh, data-based uh, management, right? Mm-hmm. Based on science facts. But um, so I think on the rollout uh, of the National Immunization Program. Mm-hmm. So, you know, some people like it, some people don't. But, you know, many people actually have written to us to commend um, Ministry, Minister Kairi Jamaluddin on his hands on what is what seems to be his hands on approach in rolling out the program. Yep. So, you know, I think mm. one of the things that a lot of them actually mentioned when they wrote to us is, you know, he appeared to have led from the front by opting for Sinovac when, you know, at that time the, there were conspiracy theories out there casting doubt on vaccines from China and other, other countries, right? So they saw that as leading from the front and like you know building trust like you said trust is really important right mm. so i mean i guess even if you know managing covid is not your core focus you have other areas of focus the larger health of the mm. public but what leadership lessons do you think we can all learn from the rollout of the program and if you can share with us your experience advising both on the program as well as to combat the anti-vaxxers. I mean, there's anti-vaxxers on social media everywhere. We go for dinner, we're telling yeah. you, but no, 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 don't listen to that. Just because you see it on WhatsApp, it doesn't mean it's true. Mm. Do you know? People, some people, they think, you know, they get it and they go like, oh, it must be true. My friend sent that to me, do you know? Yeah. 
So the, first of all, I must say that I am working very closely with Yang Mohamad Khairi Jamaluddin. Mm -hmm. So one of the areas of focus that I did tell the Prime Minister in my terms of reference now is the vaccine program. So I'm on the COVID uh, Kwasa as well with him. So, and it's a great pleasure working with the COVID task force. I think that, you know, uh, it was a very wise move from the Prime Minister to make him a coordinating minister because your health minister and other ministries are very busy mm. uh, with the day-to-day -day running of the COVID operation. So I think that he and the health minister work very closely. They co-chair the joint, uh, you know, Jautong Kwasa uh, vaccine, excess vaccine. And now he leads the sort of kind of like the operational uh, COVID task force. And that involves serious coordination. Now, I think you're right, you know, the most important thing is building trust and to build trust, it's about also very solid communications. And I think yes. without mm. a doubt, <clears throat> yes. Yambo Horma is a very clear communicator. Uh, you know, I'm always astounded that, uh, um, you know, you, you do not need to be a doctor or a health professional to manage a vaccine program. I, I want to give you an example. In the UK, mm. uh, there's a woman called Kate Bingham, who is actually the va vaccine czar, so to speak, mm. of the UK, mm. and they've been doing very well. She's actually a, 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 th a finance person. She's not even a health person, but she's just done such a brilliant job. And I think this is the same with, with, with uh, Yamba Horman and the team, is that, you know, getting it right from the start, getting clear communications, um, being able to talk to different agencies and ministries, bringing them together, getting a clear plan out, communicating that. I think that's going to be, you know, the... the, the... I've noticed also the moment there's, um, uh, you know, uh, murmurs out there, you know, he, he seems to personally jump in and address yeah. it, right? Mm -hmm. Instead yeah. of waiting, so, you know, you like nip it in the butt, so to speak, yeah. but in a clear way, like you, you have, I think information yeah. is very good because sometimes there is confusion in terms of which yeah. SOP to follow, for example. And yeah. I think you're right to build trust, to build yeah. like, comfort, as much comfort as we can build in a pandemic. Yeah. But I do want to find out, because I was listening to you on... Um, with the three stooges and <laughs> the durian <laughs> farmer last yeah. <laughs> Sunday, you came back from Johor yeah. to visit the clinic, right? Mm. The, the no, I went to visit centers. the vaccine centers. Yeah, yes. The, so you did the... mention, sorry, can you hear me? You did yeah. mention that there were, the, you know, the, of course, the worry now is, I mean, it's rolling out. Mm. The worry now is this new strain mm -hmm. found that's not detected through was it the PCR testing? That's right. That's yes. right. I, I was coming in and out my my, my wife I was not sure. But yeah. so the, the new strains and that will not be the last new strain and, and obviously you know some people they think oh the vaccine oh but you know I want to wait because I wait for the next generation is better. But you know it's mm -hmm. always work in progress. There's always uh, 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 you know uh, updates in the future. Updates but yeah. you still need yeah. to address it now. Yeah. So yeah. how do you think that's gonna affect the solutions uh, the strategies um, uh, amongst the people who are managing the pandemic, how will they want to strike? How do they achieve the right balance between mm -hmm. health, public health and managing the economy? Because a new strain might just slow us down, right? Yeah. In terms of reaching um, the herd immunity. Herd immunity. Yeah. Well, the first thing is the, you know, the faster we can get vaccines into as many people's arms as possible, the better. Because the viruses tend to mutate. You know, it's in, in the nature of viruses and they're very clever, they mutate. Uh, and then, you know, this uh, this new one in in, uh, in Brittany, in uh, France, uh, it's called the Breton uh, viruses for Brittany. It seems to have been uh, not detected by PCR and has led to some fatalities. So we don't know what the virus is going to do. And we know we have the South African variant, we we have the UK variant, and these tend to sometimes also dodge the vaccine, right? It mm. may not be as effective. So the faster you get people vaccinated, you know, the less mutation you will get because, you know, for mutations to happen, viruses have to replicate. So mm. if you start vaccinating people as quickly as possible, then the chances of replicating is lowered. So the chances of mutation is lowered. And sometimes if you're lucky enough, they mutate and they become a less virulent virus, which is good. And this is why, you know, SARS and others have kind of died off, right? Mm. They didn't go into the same situation as we are facing with COVID-19. 
So, so I think the faster we get in. The challenge, though, and this is a real challenge, is equity in excess because mm -hmm. we are lucky in Malaysia. At least we've got some vaccines, but it's very hard to get us a pipeline of millions of vaccines happening at the same time. You know, it comes in bits and pieces, and only till June do we mm. get a, a large load, right? So I think the decision by the government to, you know, bring in Sinovac, fill and finish, bring in other vaccines to fill and finish, because it, it'd be faster for us to produce it when you have the bulk and then produce the vials, mm. uh, is a good one. So, you know, that will help us to escalate the number of uh, you know, vials that can come out and more people getting the vaccines. Mm. So. Um, you know, so there's no two way back in our lives. Uh, and, and I want to repeat that, you know, now research is showing as well that COVID-19, when people are infected with it, they are, there are some serious neurological and mental health issues. It's causing depression and, and long-term neurological yeah. Yes. The long yeah. COVID, as, as they call yes. it, right? Yes. But, yes. Tansri, I have you, a question, actually. Do you mind? Uh, so, um, Tansri, I, ha I have a question from the floor. Um, so, um, hold on, I need to read it. <laughs> My eyes are not as young as Rizal's eyes. <laughs> so there's a question from one of our audience members called Jamila. Uh, the adults, 18 years and above, uh, make up approximately 70% of the Malaysian population. And they make up the population who are, who are eligible to receive COVID-19 vaccine. Mm. With vaccine hesitants, anti-vaxxers and those contraindicated that can and or cannot receive the vaccine, how can Malaysia achieve herd immunity against COVID-19? I think the usually you use 70 mm -hmm. or to 80 percent, right? Depending on yeah. the countries. Yeah. yeah. So how would that, uh, how can we achieve that? Oh, that's a very good question. So first of all, um, the current vaccines are used for 18 and above, but there's yeah. research going on right yes. now on younger people. So COVID, uh, uh, Sinovac, for example, the research is between 3 to 17 years of age. Uh, you know, Pfizer, Estes and all are doing research now on younger children. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully, you know, this is why Malaysia has bought more than 100% stock, because when it is safe for children, you know, we have already available uh, some supplies so that we can start inoculating children. Now, mm -hmm. do we? how do we get to herd immunity? 70% is the theoretical number that we use. So 70% of our so-called, you know, uh, 32 million minus 30%, so it's 70% of that. So um, will we get to 70%? I think we can. Uh, you know, if you look at the surveys done by KKM, the first survey they did, they, they found that 67% are willing to take the vaccine. 16% mm. are a little bit on the fence and then the rest are the ones who are a bit hardcore, don't want to take the vaccine. You know, and I think the trick is to bring the 16% who are sort of sitting on the fence over. This anti, over. This, the hardcore anti-vaxxers, no matter what you do, they will still be there. I'll leave them alone and, you know, just hope that they don't get COVID. Uh, but, but I think that we focus on those who want the vaccine to make sure there's they have access to that we make sure that we we focus on those who are a bit you know worried i don't think they're they're hesitant because they're anti-vaxxers but they are afraid and mm -hmm. i think the more people you know again talking about trust i can tell you the vaccine is really good but until somebody you really love gets the vaccine in in his or her arm and tells you it's fine don't be silly right yes. the chances are you will listen to the person who you really care for so it's about getting you know uh, people more people to take the vaccine to bring more people and okay. and i always yeah uh, so, sorry to cut your country but uh, you mentioned uh, kate bingham in, in the uk reports yeah. claim that countries with women leadership manage the pandemic better and depending on countries, women make up uh, about 70 to 80 percent of the healthcare workers. When it comes to empowering women, percent of healthcare workers are women, but 25 percent of them are in senior leadership roles. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know this is the problem, right? The the inequity uh, uh, in you know and 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 really not not using the talent and the experience among women to bring you know. Uh, to whatever, whether it's institution or uh, or government or whatever, that I think women have a lot to give, and um, and we have found again coming back to and this is not Jamila Mahmud saying this, right? This is Harvard Business School and everyone else saying women who have led 
in many difficult circumstances have done really well because of the empathetic leadership, right? Mm. I mean, <clears throat> Jacinta Ardern, you know, everybody loves Jacinta Ardern. I can still remember when, you know, every Friday at 12 o'clock, she goes on Facebook Live and she takes every question that's there, even about, you know, will the Easter Bunny get a vaccine, right? That's true, <laughs> that's so, true. So, so I realize that. Yeah, so I think, you know, being so down to earth, communicating so clearly in a way that is, you know, about I'm listening to you and I hear you and I know you're afraid and I know that, you know, there's so many things. And to be able to also say sometimes that actually I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we'll have to wait and see because some things, as I mentioned, there's pandemics and there's COVID-19. Yes, yes. There's some things that are so unknown still and and you know every day we're being caught by surprise by by things new things that we learn mm. so i think that that humility and all that is 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 it's a feminist uh quality right so i think that um you know this is why you know uh women have done well yeah i mean they they, they usually i mean all the the studies you know <clears throat> they say that the women tend to manage for a community and are less individualistic. Uh, but um, I think I want to move to the next part, which is still related to, to everything else that we've talked about, Tansri. It's about leading the nation forward. So I was I was watching, you know, I was I was I think you gave uh, a speech sometime back and you said you're really reluctant. Um, it's like you really didn't like to call what we've gone through in the past a crisis, the, a crisis. Yeah. You, because the pandemic could be predicted and yet countries around the world were still ill prepared, were still in denial and, and as a result, you know, time was lost um, at the beginning of mm. the pandemic. Yeah? But of course it's unprecedented, but still. Uh, you 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 alluded to the fact that we, we, we should have known that this was coming, it was predicted. Mm. Um, so, you know, maybe with women leaders or whatever, how do you feel we can gear ourselves up for the next pandemic around the corner? Because you rightfully said COVID is COVID, but there are also other pandemics. And, yeah. Yeah. and not if, the next pandemic. Yes. I still remember organising all sorts of simulations and exercises 2019 when i was in geneva my boss mm -hmm. called me up and he says there's something going on there's a world leaders conference and they asked us to prepare a simulation for a pandemic you know lo and behold it happened not long after that so we were all like you know yes it's a question of when and not if and yet when it happens you kind of get caught by surprise so mm -hmm. we don't build the systems to actually have a collaborative approach to managing a global pandemic because you, it's not about it's just like vaccines you no one is safe till everyone is safe yes. you know people will be traveling so we need to make sure that everyone has access to vaccines right whether they are Malaysians and not Malaysians whether they're coming from abroad so I think the, what we need to do now is this whole thing about anticipatory leadership right really yes. having a much more futures foresight approach to it uh, you know building this is why you know the Prime Minister wants wanted to look at health reform. What are the systems we need to build now to be better anticipate? I think there's already, you know, some ambitions now to build our own sort of CDC. You know, why didn't we have one? Why didn't ASEAN have its own CDC? Why didn't we invest in research so that we can produce our own vaccines? You know, we are smart people in this region, right? We so have is fantastic that your big yeah. thing? So, so when you talked about, you know, what what is that vision? Yeah. Uh, of this project that you're working for, is oh. that, did you just tell us no, that it was? No, 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 it's not that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just immediately no, no, jumped no. in on that. Point. No, no, no. So, so this is my big thing, right? Yeah. This this pandemic didn't happen all of a, all out, out of a, the yes. blue, right? It's because we human beings, in our bid to be developed, to be successful, in our attempt to grow our economies, to become more wealthy. We have damaged the planet, mm -hmm. right? We have damaged the environment, we've damaged our, there's something called the planetary boundaries. You can look it up. This was set up by the uh, Stockholm Resilience Center and it measures nine parameters of how our planet is doing. And because we've damaged it, therefore zoonosis or rather diseases that happen because of animal transmission to man becomes more frequent. You know, the experience has been captured by the Ministry of Health. They've, you know, have their own little handbooks and they try to, you know, look it up again and practice what they have and continually improve. 
And I think that um, I'll share with you that uh, a couple of months ago, I was invited to um, to join the Singapore uh, uh, government on a panel to talk about disease acts because mm. Singapore is already preparing for disease acts. And this is the one that WHO has been talking about as well, that is going to be a nasty, nasty virus, worse than this, and it's coming. So, um, so you know, they have really gone ahead of the curve and started looking at anticipating what next and talking to people around the world, you know, and getting, you know, advice, thoughts, whatever. Okay, that's sweet. Now we move on to the quick fire leadership questions. It's the we, fun part. Yeah, it's, it's the fun, this is the fun part. part. This is the part where we can be a bit more conversational. <laughs> conversational. Um, that's sweet. For each of these questions, you have about twenty seconds to answer. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah I know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's, like a, it's like a game show. Yeah, it's um, like a medical school exam. Uh, asking question. Uh, the first yeah. question is uh, perhaps the uh, the biggest leadership X factor and why. What's the biggest leadership X factor and why? Authenticity. I think you have to be authentic and, you know, you cannot be a leader other than the person you are. Mm -hmm. Rosie? True, and it also, it also <laughs> generates trust. Okay, second quick fire question. What advice would you give your 12-year-old self? Oh, I think um, my 12-year-old self was a rather sad 12-year-old because I lost oh. my father at oh, 11. Yes, yes. Uh, but I think uh, the advice I would have given is myself is exercise more, do more hiking and all that because I love the outdoors. And right now, you know, I don't have the stamina. Like you know, Everybody's running ahead of me. and like, you know. So I think that fitness is very important. So, so you said fitness is very important. Um, will you perhaps take up a particular sport in the future once the pandemic is over? Are you are you looking at taking up perhaps cycling? Cycling is the in thing. I do all sports. I just don't do it well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was ambitious enough in university to play squash in the men's league. Ah. So of course I lost every match, but I still went for it. Yeah. It's the experience, not winning or losing. So, okay, yeah, the next yeah. one is a favorite. Um, it is lonely at the top. Do you agree and why? Sometimes, but you don't have to make it so. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, this pandemic has, it's not so bad. So mm -hmm. I think uh, it doesn't have to be lonely. I think you've got to fill your time with good people around you and uh, good things to do. And Tasri, the hardest decision you had to make as a leader, brief, very brief. Fire people. Oh, how was that? Yes, that's very difficult. Was it? Was it? Was it difficult? Was that? Was it tough? Um, tell yes, us more it about was. It. Yeah, a bit more. Oh, I can't tell you about it because it's HR. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> but 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 I not only uh, you know had to be involved in. Uh, finding a way to remove someone who had mm -hmm. been in the organization for donkey years, but also managed to put someone in jail. So yeah, mm. those were difficult. Okay. Um, the final quick fire question yeah. before we take a couple of other questions from the audience is what keeps you awake at night? I'll say Netflix, but... Uh... <laughs> What are you watching? <laughs> what are you watching currently? Uh, I, I want to say something. If anyone watches New Amsterdam and likes it, it's all fake. <laughs> okay, I was about to consider yeah, that, so I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. now. <laughs> but, but it's good entertainment, but my God, it's so untrue. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I watch a variety. I, I watch anything that someone tells me to watch. I've become addicted to Korean drama for some reason. So, uh, yeah, so I don't really have time to watch Netflix, to be very honest. But uh, what keeps me awake at night, um, I sleep very well at night, so I... But if it's that one thing that will keep me awake, it's it's planetary health, which I'm passionate about. It's about climate change. It's about how we are not realizing we're like frogs mm. in slowly being boiled in water. Mm -hmm. And that's we, uh, let's now take uh, questions from, from the, the yes. uh, audience. I will perhaps take the first. I uh, will have, uh, take the first question, Rosie. Uh, uh, we have a question from Zaleha. Uh, uh, Zaleha asked, uh, when will you advise the PM to open up the parliament now that many, if not all, <laughs> MPs are vaccinated, Tansri? My role is totally apolitical. I tell, <laughs> I tell the Prime Minister that uh, 
it's very important to listen to the rakyat and that, you know, it's very important to get people vaccinated. So uh, I don't usually get into the political discussions because I, 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 I have to stay independent and neutral. Um, I have two related questions from two different people, but I thought I'd, I, I'll ask them together. It might be easier for you to address them together. So one is from Vignesh Swari. Will this COVID-19 vaccination be added to ba the baby's vaccination schedule? And then there's Nurul Hayati Osman who asks, how about kids? There is no, no vaccine for them. Yeah, I, I mentioned it earlier that there's research ongoing now. Uh, some of them between 3 to 17, some between 12 to, to 17. So when the vaccines are found to be safe and effective for young people, only then that, you know, if the net, net, NPRA approves, then we can start rolling out kids. Chances are it will not be given in very, very young children. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the, the, as adults, let's get vaccinated so that our children are also not at risk. Okay, Tansri, uh, we also have another question from Sunny Suwan Methanon. Uh, to be involved, mm, to, yeah. to be engaged and to contribute. Um, we will get there if the men start speaking up and saying we've got to have more women, right? So uh, you will see me on social media always calling out ma males, male-only male panels. Mm. Um, you know, we as women also need to do our job, right? We've really got to support other women. Uh, you know, I always say... I always quote Madeleine Albright. Obviously, you know, it's I don't think it's not true, but it's, it's she said it so well that there is a special place in hell for women who don't support yes, other women. I so, love that quote yeah, too. And 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 I must say, in my entire career, I've had some women like that, right? So mm -hmm. I I don't I don't wish them hell, but uh, you know, it was men who actually sponsored me, supported me, pushed me forward. So I think we need men and women. Uh, to to really you know stand up and say it is a better world when there is equal participation. We know the World Economic Forum, the banks have all showed us that when women participate in economic activity, when women are, are, are actively involved, you know the economy grows. When women are actively involved in education and in health and other um, professions, you know it becomes better for everyone. You know women are half the world's population. You know we mm. hold, yeah, we 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 need to participate. And and that's right. I think we have a few more questions on COVID nineteen. Um, uh, but but I just want to ask. Uh, because there are a few questions on COVID-19, on the vaccines. Um, yeah. Perhaps, why do you think leaders um, should also be able to communicate really well the strategies, the, the strategies, and also the SOPs? The, the you know, looking at the current um, situation where things are developing really fast, and yeah. and some leaders perhaps fail to communicate that better to people out there. That's why we have. I think perhaps... also when you look at sentiment, yeah. right? If I can just add, because you know, like there's a lot. I mean, we can read a lot when we just mm. go through social media, right? And and every time something is announced, and they go oh, typical SOP is not ready, mm. and then when the SOP is ready, like but this SOP is different from our understanding and you know so i think yes absolutely communication like you said earlier is is, is critical mm -hmm. yeah i think first of all as i said we're dealing with a pandemic of a magnitude that nobody has dealt with right in all the different agencies so i think people are learning you know as they go we're we're we are building the car as we're changing the wheel uh, driving the car as we're changing the wheel so i think that's one the number two my personal view is that you know Communication is a skill. And I think if you don't have the skill, you need to find people who have the skills. Mm. Uh, and I think, you know, again, coming back to the vaccine task force, I think this is where, you know, YB Kyrie, everyone's working really, really hard. So I think, you know, yes, you know, can we be better? Of course, we can always be better. But we, we have to cut some slack as well because people have really, you know, been stretched to the limit. And this has gone on for a long time. Okay. On that note, we thank you very much, Tan Street, for joining us. That's all the questions we can take from the audience. And thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Mahmoud, for being our guest for the second edition of Leaders Speak Easy with uh, Rizal and also Rosina. When you're less busy, we buy you coffee. Thank you yeah, so yeah, much yeah, yeah, for yeah, being yeah, here. Yeah, We'd yeah. love to, to buy yeah. you coffee. But um, 
Don't uh, forget one meter, one meter between yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do our best so, on Yes. Um, Thank you so much for being our guest. It's only our second edition of Leaders Speak Easy, but we've really enjoyed hosting you. Uh, for those of you who've been tuning in to us, look out for our next edition on 20th March. And follow us on Astro. Uh, Awani or follow on uh, or follow Astro Awani. Sorry, follow Astro Awani on our digital platforms uh, as well as LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to get the latest updates on the next editions of uh, Leader Speak Easy with Rizal and Rosina. Rosie, thank you so much again, Tantri. Uh, Bye. Bye. Enjoy. Good, Good night. night. Thank you Good for night. joining us and have a great week ahead. Night.